One day. That's how long it took from opening up the document on my computer to having a printed rule book complete with graphics and several iterated cards. 24 hours is how long all of this took. Come on, guys, what's your excuse? I mean, yeah, I admit, I <laughs> went uh, I, I went pretty basic on this thing. This name, Guard Came, it's one you've already seen before. It was the booster pack cover on the Build a Better Boosters, and I assure you, the fact that it is just card game with its consonants replaced is literally as deep as the joke goes. There's not any uh, greater meaning like the bismuth. I just like the bismuth texture. I've kind of always wanted to do that for a card back, but but no. Um, really, th that's, that's the limit of the joke, and... Still, the fact that I did this in 24 hours goes to show that it really does not take long to put a game together. I know a lot of people, you know, they're hemming and hawing about how they want to put their game together, get the rules together. Um, the best advice I can give is to stop caring about quality. If you don't care about quality, like this I made as a joke and I managed to finish it in 24 hours. Um... If you stop caring about quality, you tend to get a lot more work done. Don't try to do every little thing as though it's perfect. Make a mess and clean it up later. I mean, even even painters, illustrators, artists, they'll tell you they don't, like, start at one corner of the canvas and slowly move across applying things perfectly, except maybe people who do cross-stitch. But here's the thing, is so many of those people, they just start with a big old blob on the canvas that they mold into place. Same with things like clay or marble or, or things like that. Like, like a lot of famous paintings, there are like sketches and other versions of those pictures that, um, that exist because the painters, they practice in order to make those masterpieces. They practice, they research, they do all sorts of studies and things to get that painting together. And that's kind of what you do here. So that's what I say, make a mess and clean it up later. Although, like I said, this actually is a complete set of rules. I could build a game around this if I wanted to, if it wasn't for the fact that I made it as a joke. And as a result of that, the rules are a, a yet another Duel Masters wannabe knockoff game, complete with all sorts of stanky uh, rules and even like cringy, c cringy catchphrases like ring the came and grind up and all of those. It's it's that kind of game. So it's, it's basically Duel Masters again. Um, but it uses Battle Spirits combat system, so any so you declare attackers and they attack blindly. You can declare anything as a blocker. Um, the big change it has, though, is um, it has a damage deck. So there are the guard cards and the came cards. I mean, I don't know what a came is, the C-A-I-M-E. Um, but there's something called a cairn, so I kind of based it on that. Um, basically, you have a damage deck, and you, you randomly shuffle a damage deck of ten cards... And you can benefit from up to five of those, as the moment a sixth one of these cards hits your uh, damage area, you lose the game. But that means that every single time an opponent hits you, it's some kind of trigger effect. But because it's a shuffled deck, it's unpredictable to know what card is going to come up. It might be something that you need exactly at that moment, or it might be totally useless to you. So that's my real twist there. And I mean, you could add some dimensionality to that. Like you could have cards that uh, count the amount of damage you've taken for their effect so that they're weak at the early game, but strong in the later game. All sorts of, all sorts of stuff you can do with it. But like I said, I made it as a joke. I don't know if I'll actually take it any further. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really all it takes to, to get a game together to just start writing rules and start iterating, see what happens. It's, it's why game jams exist. I mean, people are able to, like, fully program video games over the course of a long weekend. And that, you know... Um, I, in fact, I think there's some challenges that are, like, 48 hours, even 24 hours. But, yeah, it's it's entirely possible to get a game off the ground. All you have to do is, you know, find a system that works, start iterating, get people to try it out, see what they think. It's it's not that difficult at all. Although, one thing I forgot to add on my rulebook advice list is you want to make it so that your page count is a multiple of four. Make it a multiple of four, um, except for the cover. You can kind of leave that alone. But the thing is, uh, pieces of paper have two sides to them. But when you fold that in half, it becomes four pages. So you want it to be in multiples of four, and you can fill these out with, like, you know, art assets and, you know, little diagrams. As you can see, I, I actually did that in this in this rule book here. This actually looks like a rule book that you might be able to use because it has all the little art in it. And I actually had to, on the back page, I had to, I just put the picture of the bell on the back there. This is why you see so many manuals that have things like notes pages or pages intentionally left blank and yada 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 or just, you know, spots where they don't have pages. It's because 
their rule book is not some kind of multiple of four. So like a lot of, uh, you know, people who do photography and art say, consider the negative space and how you can use it. Um, anyway, moving on. I know that the demo I did for the Pokemon game got really dramatic and intense. Um, that was kind of by accident. Um, I borrowed, like, music from this movie called Rookie of the Year. It's an incredibly formulaic um, sports movie, but it's a good sports movie. You know, if you've ever had, like, a really good steak, you know, you've had steak, you know what steak is like, but you've had, like, it's a pretty good steak. You'd, you'd have that steak again. That's kind of what Rookie of the Year is as far as a movie is concerned, but um, I admit I went pretty high octane on the drama. Um, you don't really necessarily have to go that far in your demo. I mean, it's a, it's a good idea. If you're going to make something that tells a story, you want to make the story as exciting as possible. But when it comes to game tutorials, you at least need a bit of energy. That's where, you know, you have things like, oh no, or oh yes, or unfortunately, or uh-oh, or the time has come. You know, add a bit of like human element to it. A bit of, you know, add a bit of fun. This is supposed to be a game that people play for fun. It's not like a forklift certification seminar, although I've heard getting forklift certified can be kind of fun. Vegeta, you need to be careful. He's forklift certified. <laughs> Did you know that I'm forklift certified? <laughs> oh dear God, help, no. <laughs> and that's really the central point I was making with the tutorial video is that you should make your game look fun. It should stand out. It's not, like, like I said, it's not some kind of weird clinical thing, and that's how so many of them are done. They're like like those videos you put on in class, like, oh boy, it's TV day, but you still fell asleep anyway because the video is just that boring. But, yeah, your game is fun, right? Right? I, I sure hope your game is fun. So that's why I say if you do like a video tutorial or some kind of demonstration, it should be exciting. And something that I actually cut from the video was I was going to incorporate some clips from the One Piece video where, um, like, it goes on and on and on about the things you can't do on the first turn, and, you know, like, at the first moment this comes up, the other player complains, oh, you can't, first, the player goes first, doesn't get to do much on their first turn, and I, I was gonna do a joke where they say that after every single line. I'm up first, huh? What should I do? The player going first skips this on their first turn. The player going first doesn't get to do much on their first turn. The player going first only gets one Dawn card on their first turn. The player going first doesn't get to do much on their first turn. There's nothing more you can do this turn. The player going first doesn't get to do much on their first turn. It's an example of a tutorial that, you know, is kind of faking it. You know, it, it looks like it's trying to be fun. Oh, here are these characters and they're trying to teach you the game, but they're, they're doing nothing but dry explanation. I'm not hearing the characters, you know, like, maybe have a bit of distress, have a bit of a comeback, you know, some kind of, some kind of drama. I, I didn't say it had to be like super extreme drama. It needs some, it needs some drama. Like, like these, these, uh, these folks, they're having their line reads. Um, and it, 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 it just doesn't sound like they're invested in the game. I don't know if it's the accent or what, but that's, that's how it came across to me. Um, but yes, your game is fun, right? So show us how fun it can be in the tutorial. You can have like analytical videos elsewhere, but for like a basic introduction, you should have like excitement as, as a core tenant. Also, something else I have been working on lately, uh, if you've been following me on Twitter, then you'd already know about this, but um, a big thing lately has been video game preservation. That is specifically people who want to take video games that are like no longer in print and circulation and preserve them, enable people to play them on modern hardware, you know, play them at all because a number of these games didn't become available anymore. Um, it's been a big, uh, big movement for that. And I was thinking, you know what? Why don't we do the same thing for trading card games? Um, trading card games are also the kind of thing that have to worry about falling into obscurity. You know, cards get lost, rule books get or age and get damaged and destroyed, websites get pulled down. Um, in the video, in the tutorial video, I featured a small clip from the English version of the Japanese um, edition of the Yokai Watch card game, one that is better in every way than Hasbro's one. What happened was um, Singapore is a country that gets a lot of the content made in like uh, Japan and Korea and they get it translated into English. Um, it's in, it, it's frequently read in a Singapore English accent, which I think that might be some of the reasons I think it's a bit strange, but you know, I'm gonna, gonna step into hot water if I do that. But um, it is a frequent source of English language media 
when it does not come to the United States. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, the Yokai Watch video, which was made for Singapore, appears to be lost media. That little chunk I pulled from a video I did years ago, and I haven't been able to find the um, the Final Cut file that actually has the full video in it. Um, it was trying to find that video for my tutorial video that made me realize that this kind of preservation thing is an issue. Um, because it's, it has since been privated on YouTube and I haven't been able to rip it fr uh, by any means. Um, so what I am working on is something that I call the TCG Archive Project. Um, it is a way to compile like rules and other media for like old card games and stuff. I'm specifically looking for things like rule books, play mats, um, print and play demos, tutorials, like whether that be like like documents or videos or things like that. Things that enable people to play the game. So my Huntic Mega is kind of like the perfect example of how I would put it together. Um, I do do a couple of things tricky in the Huntic Mega, but I'll talk about that later. But it's it's it contains all the components you need to play Huntic. And because I was actually able to find some Huntic print and play decks, you really can just play Huntic all the way. Right now, there are two things I do not want to collect, and those are the actual cards and things like a cartoon or a TV show. So things like, you know, the chaotic TV show or um, something like that, or like scans of the actual cards outside of, again, the print and play demo decks and the the uh, uh, videos that exist explicitly to advertise or teach people how to play the game. I can't really accept that because those are technically consumer products which can sell for money, and if I store those, I can get in a lot of trouble. I mean, I'll make an exception if the rights holders of those cards games give me written permission to host them. Otherwise, this thing is in such its infancy, I don't want to risk getting it in legal trouble, which is why things like the print and play demos right now are exceptionally valuable, because they were put out by the company themselves for the express purpose of letting people try out the game. So... As long as I stick to there, my hope is that this archive project will get large enough that companies and rights holders will want to have their game and its cards and all the rules featured on the thing. Like, I imagine that there are like some, some people who made a card game years and years ago who would love to see the uh, game get played by a new generation. If I can at least provide the rules and the playmats, so that actually enables people to play with the cards they find... Um, I could argue that by sto by showcasing the rules and the playmats and all the things surrounding the game except for the cards itself, I'm actually increasing the value of the brand to avoid legal trouble. Um, I'm also, I, I don't think I can accept, uh, there are some limits to what I can accept. It has to have at least had a print run um, or it was put out by like a major company. Like um, if, it, if it was like a failed project that a major company, like if Bandai had some video, uh, some some game that wound up on the chopping block, I would gladly take a look at that. But um, there are probably millions of people like doing little at-home projects that I don't think the Archive Project would be best for. I want to at least have that, you know, that line of um, either it was made by a large studio but got like canned at the last minute. Like I know there's a cookie jar version of Magi Nation Duel that never made it out the door. Um, I'd love to find assets for that. Um, but otherwise, you know, it has to have had a print run, um, preferably if I can get PDF format. I'm currently doing a mega, which only has 50 gigs of space, but PDFs are like one or two megabytes each. Like the only folder I have currently that has triple digits in megabytes counts is the Huntic Mega, and that's because it has the video tutorial in it. But that's my search. It's mostly for like the PDFs. Um, there are places like Staples will do uh, large scale scans of items. That's how I got the full big scan of the Huntic playmat. Um, but yeah, that is that is my effort right now. I might set up a Discord that's separate for the archive project. Uh, might set up a Patreon or GoFundMe for that to do things like pay server costs, maybe even offer bounties on things like that. So that's uh, that's my goal of the TCG archive project. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I got so many new patrons from the tutorial video. I'm so thankful uh, for you guys joining in for that. I do still have a number of slots open for my $100 consultation. If you want to hear that, I've had no complaints from people who have um, asked me to do that. I have always helped them bring in a new perspective, do all sorts of great stuff for their game. Um, but 
yeah, that is, that's the basis of tutorials. It doesn't have to be as crazy dramatic as mine, although that certainly helped out Yu-Gi-Oh! in its early days, but it does at least need to convince me that your game is fun and exciting and interesting. So many of these weird clinical things, and then you have like Arcane Legions where the guy thinks he's being a dramatic actor, but instead he's actually being like slow and boring. Um, that's what really matters. You need to convince people that your game is fun. That's the most important thing. People need to know how to play your game, but they need to know that learning this game is going to be worthwhile, that they're going to be entertained and have fun. So, yeah, hopefully we can get some uh, some more work on uh, done on that in the future. I actually have an idea for a new kind of video series. I know a lot of people have asked me to address things like game balance and stuff like that, but I don't really want to do that because my most famous video series is called The Seven Deadly Sins. So people will take what I'm talking about as either being good or bad, and I never want to talk in absolutes because only a Sith uh, thinks in absolutes. So I'm thinking of doing an idea called Playing Around With, where we literally take a look at uh, various mechanics and concepts and look specifically at the ups and downs. I know that might sound a bit fuddy-duddy for how my channel normally does it, but I think it'll be an interesting look. So, of course, you would... Uh, decide to launch your attack. I guess I guess I spoke too much about making Duel Masters alikes that my Duel Master card signed by uh, signed by the illustrators, two of them actually. I've uh, Super Explosive Volcano Don on the back. Super Explosive Volcano Don. That's just one of the best names for anything ever. So, yeah. That's uh that's the follow-up for the tutorial video. Until next time, this is Kodak signing off.